Isn't it good to be in community with fellow believers? Mosaic Conway. Yes. Hey, well, I'm so excited to be here this morning and to stand here at this holy desk to preach God's word this morning. I'm excited to be with you, Mosaic Conway Church, today. And I'm sad a little bit because my big brother Chuck, he's moving on to California to be a movie star. So I don't know what he's going to go out there to do, but I am just so excited. I'll tell you a little history. I would not be the man of God I am today without Chuck Eastman seeing something inside of this 24-year-old cat that's from Alabama, seeing something inside of me and handing off something to me, sending me out to do something for the Lord. And so I'm forever grateful for Chuck Eastman. I'm forever grateful for this church. Lord and Leela Hodges, God bless you guys, you founders, you anchors. Miss Moulton over there, bless you, sister. She gave me a job one time. I needed an extra job and she gave me one. Praise the Lord for her. And just everybody in the room, bless you. Thank you for having me today. My wife is here with me, Dominique. Hey, she's so cute. <laughs> and blessings to everybody. And let me pray. Jesus, thank you for this day. Be with us during this preaching moment. Amen. Amen. All right. So if you would turn with me to John chapter 20. And I'm still on like a Holy Ghost hangover from Easter. OK, it's Easter just does it for me. And so we're going to read something from the Resurrection Sunday. OK. John chapter 20, just verse one, verse one. And it says, on the first day of the week, Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. Everybody say early. While it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. Everybody say the stone has been moved. Now, back in Jesus' time, loved ones that passed away, were sometimes buried in caves. They would place a stone over the cave in front of these graves to prevent grave robbers and animals and anything else from getting inside of the grave, but also to prevent stuff from coming out of the grave. Amen. We don't want nothing coming out of that grave. Kai, why are you talking about graves and stones and death and stuff? Well, the stone that was placed over Jesus' tomb kept outsiders from getting in, but in Jesus's case, his body was laid there for a weekend, but he had to check out. When Jesus resurrected, he had to move up out of there and check out and clock out of his reservation that weekend, right? They closed him in because they thought he would stay there. He wouldn't relent. He didn't ease up. He didn't he didn't change his mind. He busted up out of there by his power. God bless you, brother, because I'm already thirsty. For the ones that he loves, his creation, he did this, granting everybody who believe in him a resurrected life. That's the gospel. That's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In spite of this, however, many believers have found themselves in a stuck space, a deflated, a defeated space. Many of us have given up on things that God placed on our hearts. But we, we've said things like, that family member will never get saved. I, I'll never finish college. I'll never start that business. I'll, I'll never be able to provide for my family. My kids won't ever speak to me again. My parents are so ashamed of me that I can never have a relationship with them again. I'll never be healed from this illness. Or the worst of it all, God doesn't love me. People, believers have said that out of their mouths. He isn't real. All of this is fake. Believers have said this out of their mouth. Maybe you're here right now and you're in a space where you don't even know how to approach God. Like you've, you've, you've never heard of him. Maybe you're in the room and you're just discovering Jesus. Maybe you've never heard about him or you, you, you don't know much about him. 
But I want you to know you can be encouraged that you can approach his throne with grace and confidence. A lot of us have had moments at some point where we have found ourselves buried and there's a stone blocking us in. But praise God, Jesus is bigger than any stone that they put on his grave. And praise God that he is bigger than any issue that is in your life or my life that is preventing us from living a resurrected life. We can give God praise for that. Amen. Many of us remember the day, if you're a believer, if you're a believer in the house, raise your hand. Let me see. See who I'm working with. Oh, everybody say, praise the Lord. <laughs> Many of us remember that newness. Do you remember that newness that you felt when you first got saved? Like, like a new life, like you just got a, a clean slate. That's the resurrected life. That's the beginning of it. However, like we said earlier, many of us, have, have, have found ourselves in spaces, I, I know I have, where I, I, I kind of live like Jesus never got up sometimes. Like he never rose from the dead. Like I, I don't have that resurrection power. In, in spite of all the joy and the love and long suffering and goodness and gentleness and fellowship and protection and discernment and all the things that Jesus gives me and, and you, Sometimes we live like he never got up. Am I on your road today? Like, am I in your, in, your, in your stuff, in your business? I'm in your business. I'm in my business, too. We're in a business together. Sometimes we find ourselves in this cave, but like we said, we're making a declaration. Because Jesus is risen, we are risen. And no stone is going to block us from living our true purpose in Jesus. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, rise up. Look at your other neighbor and say, I got up because he got up. <laughs> amen, amen. Now, we just read John 20, verse 1. And we read it for a reason, because that's Jesus' testimony. But did you know that this was not the first time that Jesus stood victoriously as a stone was removed? There's another time in the gospel, in the scriptures, where resurrection power was demonstrated for all people to see. The time that Jesus called for his friend Lazarus to come forth out of that grave. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was named Lazarus, I would have a hard time spelling my name in elementary school. I'm just throwing that out there. Today, though, we're going to explore that account in John chapter 11. And we're going to see how the stone has been moved in our life by what we will see in Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha's life. We're going to see how the stone has been moved even when it doesn't look like it. That's a point. Even when it doesn't look like it, the stone has been moved. We're also going to see even in our disappointment and our pain or whatever adjective you want to use to describe the stress of life, we're going to see the stone has been moved even in spite of that. And then lastly, the third point, if I get to it without shouting my uh, jacket off, um, we're going to see that the stone has been moved even in our dead spaces. Even in our dead spaces. Let's look at John chapter 11. Let's look at verse 1. I'm going to take this jacket off because it, it's cute, but it's not functional, okay? I'm sorry. I tried to be cute, but whatever. All right. Now, a man was sick. This is verse 1. Lazarus from Bethany the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And Mary was one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sister sent a message, Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness will not end in death, but it is for the glory of the Lord so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. Can I say that one more time? Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. Can I add something to this? Jesus loves you, your household, your mama, them, your dad, everybody in your household. Jesus loves all of us, right? But Verse 6, so when he heard that he was sick, 
he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Let's let's jump right into this, okay? The issue is a family friend of Jesus, Lazarus, is sick. Like really sick. Like he doesn't have allergies from this pollen or or, or the sniffles. Like he is so sick that his sister send a message to Jesus to inform Jesus that his friend Lazarus that he loves is sick. H- haven't you and myself, haven't we all been in a space where we are in a desperate situation and where things keep getting worse and worse and worse, where we need God to move and all we know to do is call on his name? Then you can imagine what our sisters Mary and Martha are going through in this situation. They're watching their brother get sicker and sicker and sicker, begging their friend Jesus for help. And Jesus comes right away. Doesn't that say that in the scripture? No, it doesn't say that. Jesus doesn't come right away. Jesus doesn't rush right away to Mary and Martha. And and this is kind of weird, isn't it? It it feels a little weird. You ever send somebody a text message and you take your time to dictate the text message You make sure you got good grammar and punctuation in the text message and the little dots, you send it off and the little dots show up and then those little dots disappear and then you get that little quiet message at the little bottom of the text that says red at 1026 a.m. and you don't hear anything from the person that you sent the text message to and Mary and Martha sent Jesus a message and said right out Jesus we need your help and Jesus came right away no Jesus waited he read the text message and didn't respond in the way that the people wanted him to respond But he gives a reason. That's acceptable, right? He gives a reason. Look at verse 4. It says, so that the Son of God may be glorified. That's what it says. It says that in yours. It says that over there too. Verse 5. It also says, because he loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. We repeated that like three times for a reason. So the the reason that Jesus gave, not because he was busy or not because he didn't have gas money or because uh, or any other reason, the reason he gave is because of the glory of God being demonstrated through his life and also the love of God. Now, I can understand the glory of God because that's mysterious, but the love of God, you can't show up for me in my hospital bed because you love me. That doesn't look like love, people. That doesn't look like how humans love, rather. They, they call, Mary and Martha are facing a cave situation, and there's a stone in their way, and they called on God, and God did not respond in the way that they were hoping, nor did he respond in their timing. And I'm willing to bet a quarter that most of us have called on God and he has either not responded the way we hope he would or he has responded in a delayed timing of our time. Now, he works in and outside of our time, but we're working on a certain timeline, 12 hours, um, uh, uh, 24 hours in a day, 365 a year, and Jesus don't work on that time, you guys. Remember, let's just, let's backtrack a little bit. Remember, verse 2 gives them, gives us a, 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 a glimpse of the relationship. It, it gives us a, a point. It says Mary had anointed Jesus' feet with her hair. So this establishes the relationship, you guys. This is not just a fly-by-night friend. We all have those surface friends that we say, hey, how was your weekend? You know, maybe y'all don't have surface friends. Maybe I do. Well, I got surface friends where I just kind of shoot it with them, you know, just have little surface conversations. No, this was a real friendship. This is their, their besties. I don't know about you, but I'm never touching somebody's feet with my hair. Now, I don't have a whole lot up here, but the little bit I have up here, I'm not touching nobody's feet with my hair. There was a relationship, you guys. But Jesus' 
action, if we're looking through human lenses, Jesus's action doesn't look like they have a relationship at all because he didn't show up in their timing. His choice to delay his arrival, his arrival, however, is the best kind of love that anybody could ever extend. And we're going to see why. Let me let me ask you this. Have you ever called on Jesus and he didn't move the way you wanted him to? And, and have you ever gotten into this wandering place where you start to think, well, does God love me? Does God care about me? Is he there? And it is in those moments that we have to remind ourselves and reapply this truth right here, that God is the God of the outcome. Uh, 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 another church word we could use is he's a sovereign God. Like he he sits high, looks low. He's a holy high God. I heard somebody pray that earlier. And so he has control of all things. He can see all things ahead of time. He can see the outcome of the process before the process even begins because he's God. He could see the outcome of Lazarus's sickness before his sickness ever landed him in the grave and the stone had been rolled over his tomb because he's God. I wish I had a shouting church with me today. I didn't come all the way to Conway to hear crickets. God is in control because he's God. Hey, <laughs> And because Jesus could see it, because he's God, Jesus moved the way that he moved because he's God. Here's something practical for us to use to remember in these moments when we find ourselves in these caves and we don't know what's going to happen. Whatever the process is, he can see the outcome. That's a truth that you can just you can put on Twitter, you can, you can put it on your phone, you can make a little wallpaper, whatever you need to do. Whatever your process is, he can see the outcome. We just have to trust in his power and his love and his foresight and, and remember that Jesus is the one who overcame it all. Death, hell, and the grave. Nothing to him. He will arrive when he wants to arrive and he will come when he wants to come. And even when it doesn't look like it, we have to remain faithful and steadfast and trust in him that he's coming when he's coming. You know, I used to I used to uh, sit around waiting for my stepdad to come home because I couldn't go outside until he came home. He came home earlier than my mom. And when we first got cell phones, I used to call. I was like, when are you coming out? So it's coming home so I can go outside and play. And my stepdad, he's from the country. He's Mississippi boy. He said, I'm coming when I'm coming. And that's Jesus. Jesus sends the message back, I'm coming when I'm coming. You know what? That's how he works with us. We've been waiting for Jesus to come back for 2,000 plus years now. And some folks have tried to predict it and all of that. But Jesus said, I'm coming when I'm coming. Come on, give God some praise. So that's the first point, is that Jesus is going to move the stone in spite of how things look. Lazarus dies. Spoiler alert. And we're at verse 17 now. Now, in the mix of it all, I'm jumping to 17 for the sake of time, but there's something really funny that happens in the mix of it. Jesus and his disciples are hanging out, waiting in an undisclosed place. And the reason why they're in this undisclosed place is because in chapter 10, Jesus is attacked by some Jewish hypocrites, and he evades the attack. Y'all know the Bible? And so his disciples are like, we do not need to go to Bethany because it's two miles west of Jerusalem, and we might get killed, bro. I'm not trying to get killed right now. And so Jesus is like, it's time for us to go to Bethany. And so Thomas, he's so funny, he's like, great. Let us go to Bethany so we can die alongside of Lazarus. It's so funny to me. Like, the Bible is funny. Um, verse 17, it says, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. And Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than two miles away. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. 
but Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give it to you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus responds. Martha said to him, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So then Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. That shouts right there. That preaches it right there. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Jesus asked her, do you believe this? She says, yes, Lord. She told him, I believe you're the Messiah, the son of God who comes into the world. Now, at the beginning of the text, it says that Jesus turn, uh, comes into the city four days after Lazarus has passed away. And if you just look at this on the surface, doesn't really mean much. But in my study time, I've discovered something so cool about Jesus and so cool about the religion of the day. So let me tell you this. So the superstition in Jewish culture of this time period says that the spirit of a dead person hovers near the remains of the deceased for up to three days. This is what they believe. This is the culture norm of the area. They believe that it was possible for the spirit to re-enter the body during that time, but after four days, the spirit would leave and go wherever it's going. You see how this is starting to take shape? Four days have gone by, so like in their superstition, according to what they believe, there is no possible way Lazarus could come back. But we're dealing with the God of the impossible. Verse 17, it says, Jesus arrived when Lazarus had been deceased for four days. And so this text shows us why Jesus waited. He isn't going to let the superstition get the glory or take credit for his power. He wasn't going to make, he, he was going to make sure that he got up. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. He was going to make sure that after he got through with Lazarus, the father got all the glory. And I'm convinced that sometimes God waits to deliver us from whatever situations that we find ourselves in, the cave, because he wants us to know and everybody around us to know that he is God and that he did this. What, what Jesus was about to do is something that only he can do. And that's what I love about Jesus. I don't want a flimsy God that can't do anything. I don't want humans to take credit for it. I don't want to deal with what humans can do because even as great as humans are, as great as Michael Jordan is, as great as Neil Armstrong was for Mark walking on the moon, there is no one like our God. Everything that we do is going to fail. Even if it's the greatest invention on earth, it's going to fail one day. But God never fails. Only God can make the stone move over our life that blocks me. Only God can move the stone that blocks your way. Only God can move you out of the grave and bring you from a dead space into a resurrection life because that's how he works. Not because the stars lined up perfectly, not because of chakras or stones, but because of him. It's Jesus. The latter part of this section is fun, but not for Mary and Martha. It's fun to look at. I'm almost certain that Mary and Martha wanted Jesus to get here get to Bethany before this fourth day because I, I assume that they probably dabbled in this superstition as well. And Jesus is about to show them who really is in charge. Now, if you look back at the text, you see that Jesus arrives to the city, right? And he uh, gets to the city and the sisters deal with him in two different ways. Both of them are disappointed and in pain. And that's the second point, is that the stone has been moved even in our disappointment and pain. 
Both of them deal with their misgivings differently. When Mary heard that Jesus got to the city, she said, you know what? I'm going to stay put. Stay right here. I'm not ready to see him. I'm in mourning. I'm, I'm just not able right now. Anybody ever been there before? Like, I just can't. This is all too much for me. I've been there. I've been so shaken by whatever life brought my way that it just debilitated me from even pursuing Jesus at times. I'll be honest, like, I don't, God, I don't want to talk to you right now. I, I just have to be real and transparent with y'all. I'm not ashamed to say that. But Jesus was so gentle and kind to me during that time, giving me space to process whatever I was going through, giving me time to come to him. And, and I want you to know that he is strong enough to deal with our distance. Like, though he, he doesn't deserve our distance, because he ain't done nothing to us, he is strong enough to deal with it. I, I'd say practically that it is okay to not be okay. Y'all ever heard that before? It's okay to not be okay, but we can't stay there. Like, living our resurrected life with Jesus means that sometimes we're going to feel pres- paralyzed by life and all that comes, and we can't move but just know Jesus is coming anyway and he will hear your cry and he will stand with you at the graveside or whatever you're going through. Now, the other sister, this is the fun part. I, I have a little imagination here. So bear with me. This I doesn't say none of this in the text, but this is just my imagination. The other sister, Martha, had a more direct personality. The scripture says she went to meet him. Now, I'm just using my imagination here. I'm going to attach the word auntie to Martha, okay? This is Auntie Martha, all right? Get, getting up out of her chair. I can imagine her hearing about Jesus. Getting up out of her chair and putting on her good wig and her good slippers and her house coat that's too small, but it fits. And Auntie grabbed her purse before she headed out the door and looked at the mirror one good time because she going to see Jesus. And she patted that hair down and she goes down the street to see why Jesus and his rabbinic self could make it here on time. And I see Martha Power walking through Bethany and all her neighbors looking around at her like, where is Martha going? Man, she walking fast. She must have been going to 10 Fitness or something. Wow. And then people, nosy people, I'm nosy. I, I'll be with the nosy person. They're getting up and following behind her and seeing where she's going. And then she arrives to where Jesus says in verses 21 through 23, she says to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even though I know whatever you ask from God, God will give to you. Martha said what she felt in her disappointment. Like she was honest, honestly disappointed, but she wasn't stuck or bound in that headspace. She expressed this disappointment while also keeping great faith in who Christ is and what he's able to do. And you can take this with you. You can write this down. You put this wherever you want. Take a picture if you must. It is possible to be let down and feel forgotten and feel looked over and broken up by God while still believing and trusting and knowing that he loves you. It's the great chasm of faith. It's this great balance of walking in a resurrected life that sometimes I'm not happy with God, but I still trust that he's God. So regardless if you're married, in this text, unable to deal with it all right now. I need a break. I'm at my capacity. Or may, maybe you're Martha, outwardly disappointed and moved to directly question God's intent. I want to encourage you that this part of life is the part of a believer. To feel hurt, to feel pain, it's part of it. This is not a good old Joel Osteen kind of message. This is not a best life now prosperity type of deal. Being a believer hurts, y'all. I wish somebody would have told me when I was nine years old and I got saved 
that, man, you're going to feel some pain over this. You're going to walk with a cross on your back, but just follow the Lord because he had a cross too. I want to encourage you that Jesus is powerful enough to deal with our disappointment and our pain. And matter of fact, he welcomes it. Bring it on. And so in your prayers, I encourage you, this is the practical step. In your prayer time, get real with him. Stop, stop playing in your prayer time. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for, uh, get real with him. Tell him how you really feel. God, I am upset right now. Lord, I'm broke. I do not know how I'm going to pay this bill. My car done broke down, the engine light on. I just got my stimulus check. I'm trying to go out of town. And here this is. Whatever your problem is, Jesus can deal with it. And not only that, he's moving on your behalf if you just wait on him to move. Now, Jesus responds to Martha with a declaration. He says, your brother will rise again. This is what Jesus tells her. He didn't come to her like, excuse me, you know who you're talking to? He didn't mansplain her or disrespect her. He spoke directly to what troubled her. He spoke to overwhelm what overwhelmed her. And Jesus is about to change the game, and we're about to see it in a minute. But before he actually does what he's going to do, he assures her, and not what he's going to do, but he assures her in who he is. He says to her, I am the resurrection and life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Even, who li even everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And he asks her this question, do you believe this? And I want to ask us the same question, do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus rose with all power in his hands and he is giving us the same resurrection power, moving the stone over his own grave so that our stones can be moved whatever they may be? Do we believe in Jesus' personhood and his lordship and his identity and his assignment that it is life? Do we believe that he is resurrection and that he is the new beginning and that he is the new life and the, new, and the power to defeat death? Do we believe that? Do we believe that, that Jesus took on death himself? Jesus laid in the tomb for those days, not, uh, 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 not by force, but by choice. Jesus, fully man and fully God, took on all the challenges and hurdles and never mumbled a word. Do we believe this? That he moved his stone in spite of being betrayed and denied. And I just believe by faith, that because he did this, because Jesus rose up, he can raise us up and he can restore us in spite of the disappointment and betrayals and in spite of any pain and hardship. He can do it because he has given us his Holy Spirit, his Holy Ghost power to be able to tread upon scorpions and snakes and serpents. And earlier in the Gospels, Jesus said, if you believe uh, with a mustard seed size of faith, that you can move mountains. So if Jesus said it, I believe it. It's done. The stone is moved. Let's look at verse 32. As soon as Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Jesus is saying right here, where have you put him? He asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. In the shortest scripture listed in the scriptures, Jesus wept. Everybody say that with me. Jesus wept. You just memorized scripture today. Look at you. The stone has been moved even in our dead spaces. Mary finally sees Jesus and tells him the same thing that Martha told him. If you had been here, 
Yet his response to her pain was a little different. He responds with gentleness, empathy, and one simple question. Verse 34, where have you laid him? Where have you laid your brother's remains? And for some of you, that is what Jesus is asking you today. Jesus is asking you, where have you laid those dead things that seem impossible to overcome? Where have you laid that devotion to his word that used to be so vibrant and alive? Maybe the pandemic threw you off last year and you're just kind of off track right now. Jesus is like, go back to March 12th, the day before it all hit. Go back to where have you laid it? Where, where have you laid that, that fire for praying for the unsaved and the de-churched and, and, and the unchurched friends and family members that you have? Where, where have you laid that down? Where have you laid that commitment to beating that addiction and not just dealing with the addiction, but actually like overcoming it? Where have you laid that? Maybe you're here right now and you've heard the gospel and you you tried or maybe you're listening or whatever. You've tried with God, but it didn't work out the first time. So you just like laid that aside. And now you're here right now. And Jesus is asking you, where have you laid it to rest? And once you realize where you laid it, Jesus is now asking you, take me to that place. Take me there. Like, he's like, here, take my hand. Take me wherever you laid it. Jesus is saying, take me to the most innermost point of your heart and watch me renew you and save you and shape you and mold you and revive you and whatever else you need. Watch me bring to life the thing that you thought was dead. Watch me bring you into resurrection life when you thought you were lost. Jesus is saying, watch me bring that marriage back to life. Watch me bring whatever it is that you are dealing with back to life. Maybe, maybe, maybe somewhere you turn cold because somebody hurt you in your past. Maybe you lost your zeal. And Jesus is saying, watch me bring that back to resurrected life. Jesus is asking us right now, asking us to take him to the place that brings us the most pain, the most hurt, the most grief, the, the most embarrassment, the most vulnerability. And he wants us to take him to that place so he can first weep with us over it. So he can feel with us, be broken with us over it. To be brought to our knees and his knees over it with us. He wants us to take it all in with him, just like he did it with this family. Later in the text, you can come and play Elena. Later in the text, Jesus called for the stone to be removed. Jesus called for the stone to be removed, and Martha cautioned him, telling him that the body stinks by now. Look at it. It says in verse 38, look at it. Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the stone, to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was laying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. That's a command. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there's already a stench because he's been here for four days. Jesus still wants to go there. He, he, he didn't care about the smell, you guys. He didn't care that he was dealing with the dead man's remains because his power overcomes that. Jesus still wants to go there with Lazarus and he wants to go there with you. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you've been some places that you know you shouldn't have been or maybe you've been with some people that carry a smell, but Jesus isn't worried about that. Jesus still wants to go there with you. Maybe, maybe you don't have the right clothes or you don't talk like those church folks talk. Jesus isn't worried about that. I can tell you for sure. He ain't worried about that with me because I don't talk like church folks talking. It gets me in trouble all the time. Jesus is calling you forth. He says, Lazarus, come forth. He's calling you forth. 
calling some of you to walk out of that grave for the first time. Maybe you are here by happenstance and you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior. Jesus is calling you out of that. Maybe you're in this room right now and you've been with Jesus for a while, but somehow you found yourself in a cave. And he's calling you forth out of that cave. For many of us in this room, though, we are believers because I saw y'all hands raised up. So that means we're living a resurrected life. It's time for us. Ooh, it's time for us to go and call other people out of the grave. We know some folks that are in a cave right now. We know some people that need the hope of Jesus and resurrected life right now. You probably could text them right now. You know their name right now. And guess what? We're going to pray for them right now. So if you could just use your mind and think of one person, one's, one person's name that you know needs, they need to hear Jesus call them forth. Once you got them in your, in your heart, I want you to just pray. I want us to just soak this room with prayers for that person. And then I'm going to challenge you right after church, call them, text them, try to get coffee with them this week. Start the process. This is how we make disciples. This is how we build God's kingdom. You got the person's name in your heart? Let's pray. loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Verse 44, the dead man came out bound hand and foot. He was dressed like a dead man because he was a dead man, but he's not a dead man anymore. And because he's not a dead man anymore, it says, unwrap him and let him go. Take those dead clothes off and embrace a new life. And the, probably the most important part of this text is right here in verse 45. Therefore, many Jews who came to Mary and saw what he did believed in him. So you mean to tell me that the stone that's over my life is not really about me. It's about building God's kingdom. That whatever stuck space we find ourselves in, whatever issue we find ourselves in, we have some illness, some sickness. It's not really about me. It's about everybody that's watching me and how I conduct myself during this and how God gives me victorious life after this. I'm going to come out of this. Look at yourself. Say this to yourself. I'm going to come out of this. Because Jesus says so.